darkness, the breeding ground of horror, where fiends not of this earth appear. Moments of terror, and how we relish them. A haunted mansion where actors, papier-mâché, and paint speak a language we know well, the language of horror. We learned it from superstitions, tales, comic books. But most of all, we learned it in those other halls of darkness. The movie theaters of yesteryear. Desperate heroes, beautiful heroines, villains, monsters. Always they were there to provide us with our beloved moments of terror. Grotesque images torn out of our own dark, our own earliest nightmares. Try as we may, we are never quite able to leave them behind. And that's the horror of it all. It seems we are forever drawn toward what we fear. Young or old, we are tempted to go inside the darkness, to come out on another side, a temptation for which we have always been willing to pay. We grow up with a certain hunger, not only for the bright things in life, but for things that are fearful. And, and terrifying. The filmmaker puts something on the screen and each individual member of the audience adds something unto themselves to complete the process. You know, if you wonder why the continual preoccupation with horror in motion pictures, there's a reason. People love to be scared. The great horror movies of bygone days are like extensions of nightmares, past and present. A secret word in the 1920 film, The Golem, gives magic power to a sage. So taken was Paul Wegener with the legend of an inanimate figure who becomes a champion against oppression that he three times turned it into film. Wegener's own impressive size enabled him to play the giant clay statue brought to life. The golem set a pattern, defying the laws of God and man, even with good intentions, inevitably led to disaster. We learned, too, that beautiful women would never be safe with monsters. Also, in horror films, leading men are invariably ineffectual against monsters. In the cabinet of Dr. Caligari, also produced in Germany in 1920, horror took on a uniquely subjective cast. A sinister figure, Caligari reveals his strange powers over a sleepwalker. To project the world of a psychotic, this film uses painted flats to create a threatening and surreal environment as Cesare, the somnambulist, goes forth to commit the murders commanded by his master. This scene was so unsettling that it helped make The Cabinet of Dr. Caligari one of the most discussed films of the 20s an abiding dread that would be aroused repeatedly in horror films of the future, being attacked when we are most vulnerable, while we sleep. The cabinet of Dr. Caligari catapulted Conrad Veidt to world attention 
and it bore home the axiom horror films would repeat. Our monsters were invariably very human and vulnerable to beauty. One of horror's most reliable staples, guaranteed to produce dread in any audience, the story of the vampire. In 1922, moviegoers were mesmerized by the German-made Nosferatu, an early working of the Bram Stoker novel, Dracula. This was no simple creature made from clay, no sleeping figure locked in a trance. This was the undead, a monster who retreated by day to his coffin, but who roamed by night to feed on human blood. In director Fritz Lang's Metropolis, a fantasy and horror film, also from Germany, the heroine is trapped in the very world of the dead, the dark catacombs of a city in a far distant future. As always, the heroine's cries bring no rescue. Her villainous pursuer, the arch-heavy of the horror film, the mad scientist. A scene that would echo and re-echo in horror films to come. The laboratory where a scientist dares imitate God as he transfers the very soul of a human being to give life to his robot creation. European horror films emphasize the supernatural. But in the United States, horror had a more realistic base. In 1920, a prohibition conscious audience readily accepted that in Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, even a single drink could lead to terrible consequences. John Barrymore's performance made that possibility chillingly believable. He understood Stevenson's play. Stevenson mentioned that he was the personification of evil, but it was the evil of his expression, and it was not achieved by Barrymore with makeup. You know, the, the leading men are not remembered by the public. It's the heaviest that are remembered, because they're the characters in plays and in motion pictures who are the active ones. The leading men are acted upon, but the heavies, the villains, are the ones who do things. Uh, that's why the great actors of, oh, ever since Betterton have preferred to play the heavies. Lou Telligan was a leading man to Sally Bernhardt for many years. He came to the States, and uh, I got to know him because we were both sculptors. He was an extremely handsome man with a magnificent physique, walked like a panther, had a cold gray eye that you could see a mile away. And he once said to me, I love my men of sin. Lon Chaney, one of the great actors of silent films, gave his men of sin a thousand faces, each more fear-inspiring than the next. Chaney's pride was that he not only performed his own stunts, he also created and applied his often spectacular makeup. One of his greatest films, made in 1925, The Phantom of the Opera. The important element is that much of it takes place in the semi-darkness of catacombs. 
In a way, the Paris Opera House is a symbol of the unconscious mind in which dwells monstrous desire. And this struck a resonant chord in many of the masculine members of the audience. Cheney's performance, because he spent much of the time wearing a mask, was a matter of ballet. He was a master, a consummate master of pantomime. Phantom of the Opera didn't have any overt supernatural implications, but we had a man who slept in a coffin, who lived in catacombs five levels below the Paris Opera House, and who masked himself to disguise a hideous face. And in a way, he pressed the buttons of an audience that at that time was very unaware of the sexual symbolism involved. But it registered nonetheless, because in effect, the character of Cheney is portrayed in the Phantom of the Opera was that of a man who is ashamed or afraid of his own sexuality, who conceals his monstrous desire, as it was termed in those days, under a mask. When it is revealed, the heroine recoils in fright from a kindly, gentle man who is now revealed as a hideous being. The unique quality of the silent film in America was that it did not deal with supernatural topics per se. Actually, evil was personified by the ugly and the deformed, as in the case of Lon Chaney and the other actors, and it took place usually in an atmosphere of darkness. We knew, of course, that handsome people were almost invariably good, and that uh, deformed, elderly, unfortunate people were bad. This we had learned in our fairy tales as children. Now we were seeing those fairy tales in darkness up there on the screen. Without benefit of Freudian psychology, without benefit of special effects, the important thing is we believed what we saw, and it frightened the living blazes out of us. A 1927 American film that did frighten the blazes out of audiences, The Cat and the Canary. The dark, haunted mansion where terror could lurk in every corner became part of the growing language of horror. It was where anything could happen, and often did. Again, the leading man proved undependable. But at least in this film, he provided comic relief. A classic moment of horror and the source of countless nightmares. In 1931, Svengali, starring John Barrymore, was released. Sound had arrived, increasing immeasurably the ways films could influence the emotions of audiences. Bengali's true impact came from the unsettling demonstration of mind control from afar. Here was no mad scientist intent on creating life. This villain is able to take a life over. 
gentlemen, it uh, might be as well to remember there are more things in heaven and earth than are dreamt of in your philosophy. These mysteries became a challenge for a new generation of filmmakers. Mr. Zucker, the head of Paramount, called me up and asked me if I would like to do a film of the famous Stevenson story, Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. I saw the story uh, as a conflict between, not between good and evil, as it used to be done before, where uh, um, Jekyll becomes an evil person, a monster. Uh, but I saw the story more as a conflict between the high aspiration of every human being and his lower, baser instincts. And that the whole idea was to have a young man, very handsome, whose whole uh, intention is to free himself from all the evil impulses, all the animal impulses, really, not evil, animal. And the idea with Frederick March was <clears throat> that he, when he becomes Hyde, he does not become a monster, but he becomes our common ancestor, the Neanderthal man. And Frederick March gave a beautiful performance and wound up by winning the, the Academy Award. <laughs> It was the same year, 1931. One of the films designed to meet a public appetite for movies that scared was The Bat Whispers. There was the reliable old mansion at night. This time the menace casting shadows a bat in human form, shades of terror to come. Outside, the reliable thunderstorm. And inside, a heroine who naturally insists on going where no one in her right mind would even dream of going, through the ever-present secret door. One essential sound of the horror film, the scream of the terrorized heroine, was yet to be heard. tradition of the mystery horror film, the villain is eventually unmasked. There'll be no getaway this time. You think you've got me, eh? Well, let me tell you this. There never was a jail built strong enough to hold the bat. And after I've paid my respects to your cheap lockup, I shall return at night. The bat always flies at night, and always in a straight line. The bat, enacted by Chester Morris, never did manage to return. But in the same year, another kind of bat descended on the movie-going public with the release of Dracula. Bats, wolves, and vampires became honorary members in horrordom's Hall of Fame, as did Dracula's star, Bela Lugosi. After this one production, the supernatural would become an enduring element of the American horror film. Also in 1931, another movie was destined to become a classic, creating a new horror star, Boris Karloff. The film was Frankenstein, based on the early 19th century novel by Mary Shelley. 
Yet again, a scientist dares attempt to create a life. The result? A monster who would eventually turn on his creator. Never before, and perhaps never again, would the elements for producing terror in an audience seem so perfectly fused. It's very interesting to compare these two films that were made almost at the same time in the early 30s, uh, in that <clears throat> they both dealt with the theme of death. Dracula with an undead creature brought back to life, living off of the blood of the living, and the Frankenstein monster, a creature made from parts of dead bodies, and perhaps doubly terrifying for that reason. When I was much younger, I knew the late James Whale, and uh, he told me a fascinating anecdote about the first sneak preview of Frankenstein, which was held in Santa Barbara. While he was sleeping in the middle of the night, he was awakened with a phone call, and a voice came on the line saying, are you the director of that film that was previewed tonight? And he said, yes. And the voice said, well, I can't sleep, and I'll be damned if I'll let you sleep. And James uh, found this uh, story to be very amusing. And it was a characteristic of his horror films, particularly, that they were always very much leavened with humor because uh, he felt, and I think rightly so, from a dramatic point of view and from the audience point of view, that it was very important to relieve the, the, the tension that was built in a horror film with humor along the way. Um. There was humor in White Zombie, a blend of horror and gothic romance made in 1932. Not all of it intentional. However, in this film, another method used to build tension was an especially effective music track. White Zombie clearly showed the influence of the earlier film. Once again, Bela Lugosi played the arch-villain, the harbinger of doom. Who are you? And what are they? For you, my friend, they are the angels of death. Not surprisingly, the leading man was inadequate. the heroine, helpless. It was uh, 1932, and James Whale had just finished Frankenstein, which was an enormous success, with Boris Karloff, who was the star of The Old Dark House 2. We had Charles Lawton in his first American film. We had Raymond Massey. We had Melvin Douglas. And I was very impressed. Boris was as charming and gentle a person off screen as he was horrendous and threatening on screen. There was a great deal of uh, thunder going and lightning and rain coming in and cobwebs and doors creaking. As a leading lady, it was my job to be very, very frightened. So Mr. Whale put me into a pale silk velvet bias cut evening dress, very decollete, and I asked him why, and he said, because when Boris is chasing you through the corridors, I want you to be like a flame going through the house and be very threatened, and that was my role, to be very threatened, very frightened, and to scream a lot. You know, actually, I think that putting me in pale pink silk velvet 
uh, added to the feeling of fragility and uh, uh, and help uh, helplessness that actresses needed in in horror films because if the beautiful young actress or lady is not threatened there's there's no horror the horror film playing at the neighborhood movie house became like a visit of dearly valued old friends how audiences loved those actors they had learned to hate high on their special enemy list was lionel atwell his most frequent victim Faye ray a 1933 film, The Vampire Bat. You. You're the one. What mad thing are you doing? Mad? The one who has followed the secret of life to be considered mad? Life. Created in the laboratory. No mere crystalline growth, but tissue. Living, growing tissue. Life that moves, pulsates, and demands food for its continued growth. <sighs> you shudder in horror. So did I the first time. No one expressed the lunatic logic of the mad scientists better than Lionel Atwill. I have lifted the veil. I have created life. Wrested the secret of life from life. Now you stand for the lives of those who have gone before. I have created life. I'll tell Carl. Kay Ray was every fan's ideal of a beautiful, threatened heroine. For tonight, Carl's name will be added to yours. And all of those whom this achievement will immortalize. Safe now, dear. It's like a horrible. When would leading men stop like, being so like wrong? Now it's all right. Don't worry. I'm gonna stay right here with you. Surely, Fay Ray never had better reason to utter her famous scream than in the classic horror film of 1933, King Kong. But audiences everywhere understood. Love was what the monster gorilla really felt for the beauteous Fay. Makeup alone doesn't make the best monster. The best monster is one whom we, as members of the audience, can recognize through the makeup as having some of the qualities that are buried within ourselves. All of us got some kind of vicarious pleasure, I'm sure, out of watching King Kong go on a rampage and tear down the very symbols of New York City that represented wealth and power and prestige, which most of us were denied because most of us were very poor during the Depression. We paid a dime, or 15 cents, or 25 cents tops to see King Kong and the other monsters. Those of us who were adolescents got the same kind of satisfaction and gratification out of watching Frankenstein's monster, because he, in a way, was a very symbol of adolescence. Lumbering, inarticulate, ugly, unwanted in a society where uh, age was uh, deemed superior to youth. It's hard to believe that it's turned around, but it has. <laughs> 